This morning over at the uh, Magnolia campus had Pastor Strickland preaching. This morning at this campus, Brother Lenny Zahn's going to be preaching. Lenny is always comes with a word from God. Uh, I really do believe this is a man who loves Jesus with all his heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Amen. And he's a precious brother in the Lord. I thank God he's brought him to our fellowship. God's using him here as one of our lift leaders, one of our elders. And uh, I'm just excited about him what God's doing in him. I try to encourage him as he's in seminary working on a ministry degree and wrapping that up hopefully sooner than later. Amen. And I know it's difficult to do all the ministry that he does, do school at the same time, and still do a full-time job and have a family. That's, that is a handful. So, uh, but I want him to have this opportunity. Uh, we finished this series, uh, you know, last week, week or so ago on uh, Breaking Free. And uh, I told my guys I need about two Sundays to start getting ready for everything else we're doing this year from the marriage retreat on. And uh, praise God we've got guys like Lenny and Tim. We can rely on these kind of situations. Amen? So y'all welcome, Brother Lenny. Okay, I'm officially on. Good morning. Hey, before we get started, um, let me just say this. One, um, Pastor Joe, thank you so much for letting me be a part of what is going on here at Believers um, Fellowship. It is my joy and my honor uh, to have an opportunity to share the word um, with you this morning. As you look behind me, um, you see a slide. Um, gentleman by the name of Pastor Willie Dingler. Uh, Willie and I know each other. Um, some of you actually had an opportunity to meet him uh, when he was here. Uh, he's coming back. I do an incredible ministry with him in South Africa. And we as a church are considering uh, full-time support uh, of this ministry. And so uh, normally we have uh, Wednesday night services, but the night that Willie is going to be here, uh, is the, uh, um, the week of the uh, marriage retreat. So we're going to have service on Monday night that night as opposed to Wednesday night. So it'll be 7 o'clock on Monday night, uh, September 22nd. I know that you will be blessed by Pastor Willie Dingler. Um, this is a man who has, he has lived a life. He is pastoring the same church for the last 42 years. And he has seen... Um, the incredible atrocities that have taken place in South Africa. He has worked through those atrocities. He now pastors a church in a neighborhood where he is the only evangelical church. It has been completely surrounded by mosques. And um, uh, South Africa is at a point, and I'm going to get off my, my box with this, but South Africa is at a point where the Muslim contingency has gotten to the point where they are trying to instill Sharia law in South Africa. And we have one voice, and that is the voice of Christ. And when you hear Willie's story and encouragement, I know that you will uh, be blessed by it. So uh, I hope to see each and every one of you here on the 22nd. So let's talk. You know, it's an intimate uh, environment today, and so I wanted to... Uh, uh, try and take a moment and share with you. Uh, Friday night, we were at the uh, leadership uh, dinner for ministry, and I had already prepared a sermon for this morning. And Pastor Joe started talking about uh, 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 what it means to be involved. And even though we're not called necessarily, uh, we don't think we're called, uh, we have a job to do. And it flipped, turned my entire sermon upside down, and I went in a completely different direction. So here we go. Okay? Amen? So I want you to, I want you to think back, put your, your history hats on. Okay? It's 1939, and we're in Lithuania, of all places. Okay? There is a general council from the country of Japan in Lithuania, capital city. And things are going on. It's, it's the verge in the midst of the Second World War. And it's like all these crazy things are going on. The Nazis are invading Poland. Um, 
refugees are rushing, Jewish refugees are rushing to get to Lithuania. We hear about the atrocities, you know, but here in the United States, we're, we're so far removed they, that it, it's, it doesn't mean a whole lot, you know. The, the Nazi Third Reich is, is taking its toll on all of Europe and its plan to take over the world. But there sits the general council for Japan in the city that is called the capital of Lithuania. And Mr. Uh, Sugahara realizes that he is going to be transferred. And when the Soviets come in to Lithuania, they're pretty much going to do away with all of the Jewish population. And, you know, let's think about this. The Japanese were part of the Axis. They didn't like the Jews any more than the Nazis liked the Jews or, or anything like that. But Mr. Sugihara was convicted. And a small contingency of Jewish leaders came to, him, came to him and begged him to start to write visas so that they could get out of the country. And he didn't really want to do it. But he said, okay, I will call up to uh, uh, Japan and see if they'll allow me to do this. Three different times they come back, no, let them die, leave them alone. They're not worth it. But you see, Mr. Sugihara was a Christian man. And he couldn't, he and his wife, just let them fall by the wayside. So for 29 days, Mr. Sugihara and his wife wrote 300 visas a day by hand. 6,000 Jews were saved because of it. Now that's 6,000 then. When you start to multiply and think about the generations that exist today because of the act of one man, you have to start to question yourself, where do I stand in my life? Am I willing to take a stance for the cause of Christ and to go where it might not be so popular to go? Here's what happened to Mr. Sugihara. He went back, he was transferred, he went back to uh, Japan and was disgraced by the government for what he had done. And he spent the rest of his life doing odd jobs and selling light bulbs. And nobody really knew about the story of Mr. Sugihara until sometime later down the road when his son was asked about it. And he said this. Well, his son was asked this question. How did your father feel about his choice? And his son replied, my father's life was fulfilled. When God asked and called on him to do the right thing, he was available to do it. You see, all through life we are faced with choices and how we respond defines us as who we are as Christians. You could say, no, I don't want to go, and I'm talking it might just be next door. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles. And I want you to go to the book of Jonah. And some of you are going to sit here and say to me, Jonah? That's a Awana's story for Sunday morning for the kids to learn about the big fish. But you see, there is just so much more to the book of Jonah and Jonah the prophet. So I want to invite you to open up and I want you, as you look at the um, slide behind me, you see you can run, but you cannot hide from God. And we are going to survey this book. In 40 minutes, we are going to survey the entire book of Jonah. 
And what's going on? You know, a lot of people uh, have written, I say a lot of people, but scholars have written that this is really not a historical book, that it's an allegorical look at uh, what has taken place, that it is a, a mixture of stories that have been compiled to make us feel a certain way. But I'm here this morning to share with you that through research and, and, and all the scholars, it is factual as God has told us that his word is God breathed every single one of it and that it, it is a true event that has taken place. What's going on during this time? You know, uh, Jonah was actually retired. So for those of you who are out there who are retired, let me say this. There is no retirement. When God calls on us, I don't care if you are five or 95, God has called us and it is our job to go. Wherever it is, he tells us to go. You know, Jonah as a prophet, and we know that he existed because he's mentioned in 2 Kings 14, 25. We hear about his, who he is the son of. We know where he came from. We know he existed. We know that he was a prophet who prophesied over Israel saying that good things are going to be happening. And so he was obedient. He answered God's call. And he was kind of hanging out. You know, I'm relaxing now. I did what I was supposed to do. I got no place else to go. But God calls him. God calls him and says, you know what? I need you one more time. I don't know how many times in my life uh, I have said, no, 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 don't want to go, you know? But uh, unfortunately, the Lord has a completely different plan. So as we look at, uh, there are four points that I want to make uh, this morning. And uh, for those of you who know me, it's difficult for me not to be verbose and talk a whole lot. Um, but I'm going to do my best uh, because we have a lot of material uh, to cover. The first point is that Jonah ran from God. And we're going to look at that first chapter and see what is going on. So uh, here in the first chapter, we see that the word of the Lord uh, came to Jonah. He spoke to Jonah, uh, and he's, uh, who was the son of Amittai, and he says, listen, arise and go to Nineveh. Well, Jonah starts walking back and forth going, Nineveh? Of all the places in the world that you want me to go, you want me to go to Nineveh? Here is the capital city of the Assyrian nation, one of the most cutthroat, vicious, horrible ruling uh, 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 powers ever to exist in our time. He says, listen, I'm about to smite them. But I want you to go and I want you to preach repentance. And, you know, if, for those of you who, who know, you know, Jonah, his head spun around about three, four times. And he said, you got to be kidding me. There is no way that I'm going. But Jonah rises up. But not to go to Nineveh. He rises up to flee to Tarshish. Tarshish uh, uh, from the presence of the Lord. So why? So he went down uh, to Joppa, found a ship, uh, was going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He's running away. <laughs> I started thinking about this. I started thinking about times where I've run from my dad. I said, you know what? I'm going to hide. Now, in the neighborhood that I grew up, there was no place to hide. <laughs> you know, my father could stand on the stoop of the house and he could call my name. It didn't matter where I was in the neighborhood. Somebody heard my father and they'd come running after me and say, your father's looking for you. I don't know what Jonah was thinking when he thought somehow he could run and he could hide from where God was and that God was not going to be able to find him. He told him to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to, and he flees. And in, in verse 4, 
God shows him some wrath. And he says to him, he says, the Lord, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break. And I started thinking about my dad. When my dad got angry at me, I being the ship, okay, he got a hold of me and trust me, I was about to break. And I didn't like being in that place. And in verse 5 it says, Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. What's important about that verse is this. It's God with a little g. We know that the people on this ship are not believers. Here is Jonah running from God. He's on a ship with heathens. They don't know what's going on. They're scared out of their wits. And what does Jonah do? <laughs> Jonah goes down below and he goes to sleep. He says, I just don't want to deal with this. How many of us, knowing what God is asking us to do, crawl back into bed and say, I don't want to do this. I'm hiding and I'm done. If we scroll down to verse 7, it says, Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and lo and behold, who did it fall upon? It fell upon Jonah. And the captain goes down there and says, Hey man, how in the world could you be asleep right now when all of this is going on. And so finally he comes up after all this craziness is happening and verse 9 is a key point. He says to them, Jonah speaking, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, of, uh, the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Now, I want you to keep in perspective because we use this word fear in many different contexts. But what, what Jonah is talking about here is not being afraid of God, but that in the fear of the Lord, and I think it's Proverbs 1 where we see that, but in his talking about the fear of the Lord, he is talking about the reverence that he has for the God who has created the heavens and the earth. And so they were, all, they were all wigging out, and the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because obviously he had told them. You know, Jonah's running, he's hiding. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because he knew that the God that we serve is a compassionate, grace-filled, merciful God. And he knew that the Ninevites, the Assyrian people, were so vicious, so brutal, that he did not want them to be saved. And so he runs, and he tries to hide. I, 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 I spoke to a, a gentleman not that long ago, and he said to me, how could you justify believing or saying that a man who is in prison, who has committed murder, has the right to go to heaven. And Jonah is asking the same question of God. How is it that these Assyrians, who would take their enemy, stick them on a stick in the ground, and skin them alive, how is it possible that you are willing to save those people And so he runs. And so these guys were all freaked out. And Jonah says to them, listen, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then uh, uh, the sea will become calm for you. And what do they do? Then they, uh, they called on the Lord because they didn't believe Jonah. They called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Now listen, verse 16. He says, then the men feared the Lord. They realized who God was. <laughs> 
they got saved. At that moment, they got saved. And the Lord appointed a great fish. Here's Jonah. They throw him overboard. They go ahead and they do it. And the Lord looks at them. He says, okay, you're mine now. And he appoints this great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. He showed his anger. When, when my dad would show his anger, and let me say this, it was not a pretty sight. Okay? And I think sometimes, and I'm going to go to meddling for one second, I think sometimes we have failed our own children because we do not show them what it is to fear the Lord, to have reverence so that they know the difference between right and wrong. So Jonah is swallowed up by this fish. And now he's, he's in the fish. And you know, Jonah ran from God in the first chapter, but in the second chapter he runs to God. He, he realizes what he has done. And if you read the second chapter of Jonah, it is, it is not written in such a way that uh, there is a historical viewpoint that is being brought forth. It is written just like a psalm. As if David had written this psalm, this song that he is singing to the Lord, and, and he says to him, I called out in my distress to the Lord. And what did the Lord do? The Lord answered him, even though in the midst of his disobedience, in the midst of him trying to run away, in the midst of him doing everything contrary to what God had called him to do, he cries out to God, and God hears him. He answers him. He says, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. That word Sheol, it's like being, being in the grave. It is, it, it is equated to being separated from God. Jonah had been separated from God. He cries out to God from Sheol. And what happens? God hears him and answers him because of the merciful God he is. He says, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. But here, is it, here it is in the latter part of verse 4. He says, so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. And nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Although I have backslidden, although I have done the things contrary to what you would have me do, I'm running back to you, Lord. I'm running back to you. So if you're sitting here this morning and you feel like you have not earned the right, you don't have to earn the right. Just call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jonah called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord opened his arms and brought him back. In verse 6, he says to him, I descended to the roots of the mountains, to the very, very bottom. But he says this. He says, but you have brought, my, uh, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. You have saved me. So many people that I know in my life that continuously tell me I'm going to get right. And as soon as I get right, I know that I'll be able to go to the Lord. For those of us that are sitting in this room this morning who have been in that pit and had a ladder that was not even big enough to get me to the curb, we know that there wasn't anything that we had to do in order to realize the love, the grace, and the mercy of the only living God.
And he goes on in verse 9, and he says, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. He gives himself up. He says, I'm with you. I'm with you wholeheartedly. I am with you. The God we serve hears the, the people of all nations. It is not just Houston, Texas. But we have got to start someplace. And Friday night when we talked about ministry in this church and we talked about the need for us to rise up and to do the work that God has called us here in our own house, how could we not answer the call? Jonah struggled, just as many of us struggle. You know, we all have lives. We've got families. We've got work. We've got stuff. God understands the stuff, but it does not mean that we are not to do the work that he has called us to do. You know, Willie's coming here. He hears the cries of Africa. He hears the cries of the 35,000 prisoners in South Africa that have gone through discipleship, have called upon the name of Jesus, and have been saved, have been baptized, and are taking the message to other prisons throughout that country because we have answered the call. Jonah realized in verse 10, Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it did what? It vomited, literally vomited Jonah out onto the real ground. I don't know about you, but my head would be spinning, okay? Um, I, and I, I'm going to take you just briefly uh, to, uh, to uh, 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 Matthew uh, 12, you know, what's interesting is that Jesus himself talks about Jonah, which is another reason to understand the, the historical, uh, uh, factual part of this entire uh, encounter that took place. But what does Jesus say? He says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the, er in the heart of the earth. He is drawing a parallel. Jonah is an example of what is yet to come. He spent three days and three nights, and yet he lived. Jesus spent three days and three nights, and he rose again. And Jesus goes on and he says, The men of Nineveh will stand up with the generation, uh, with this generation uh, at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What a mighty, mighty God we serve. And as we get to chapter 3, here's where Jonah listened to God. And it is incredible to see all of this unfolding. Because you see, growing up, I, I shouldn't even say me growing up, but just growing up in church in general, we just hear the story. We hear the story about the big fish and how Jonah was, you know, thrown out of the big fish. But in chapter 3, God called Jonah a second time. He is a God of second chances. You might not get it the first go round, but as long as you are here, he will convict you of what it is that you are supposed to be doing. And so God calls Jonah a second time. He says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise and go to Nineveh. Listen, Nineveh was about a three-day walk through. Understand there are 600,000 people in Nineveh. And he says, here's what I want you to preach. He goes, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 
Jonah is the only prophet who was sent into a heathen nation to preach repentance. This book is not so much about prophecy as it is about the experience of a man who was trying to run from God, who had called him to do the work that God wanted him to do. And here he is in chapter 3. And so, obediently, Jonah goes, and he preaches repentance. And then in verse 5, the, the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. But it wasn't enough that the people called upon the Lord. The king of Nineveh then put a decree out so that the 600,000 people in this city would know that it was time for them to put on the sackcloth and sit upon the ashes. And it wasn't enough for just the people. He said the beasts of this land must also do the same. You must fast. You, you must put sackcloth on and realize that we have just called upon the only living God. And in that hope, in that calling upon God, their prayer was that they would not be smithed. He says in verse 8, he says, uh, 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 let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. They recognized what kind of a people they were. Is it really that different today in our times when we look around and we watch the news, and we, whether it's in this city or is it, it's at the ends of the earth, think about what is going on in our world. We, as believers, must preach repentance. Paul went to the Corinthians who said that they were believers but their, their debauchery wasn't ending. He says, look, I didn't come to you with fancy words. I'm not here trying to get you to believe that you need a theological education. He says, I preach Christ crucified. That's all we need to do. Folks, you don't need to know every commentary that's ever been written. You don't need to read Greek or Hebrew. You just need to go to your next door neighbor and tell them Christ crucified. He died, he rose, and he lives today. It is not that much of a message for you to do. In verse 9 he says, who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's big. It's big. God is calling you today. He is calling you today. Today, not tomorrow. It's not about yesterday. Could have, would have, should have mentality. He's calling you today to go next door and tell your neighbor Christ crucified. He's calling you today to go to the ends of the earth. There is a reason why we read Acts 1.8. There is a reason why we look at verses 19 and 20 in Matthew chapter 28, when he says, Go therefore, making disciples of all the nations. Go, be a part of what it is that God wants to do in and through you. In verse 10 of chapter uh, uh, 3, he says, When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. So I don't care if you're sitting here today and you think you are worthless and you don't think that there is any way that God would look upon you and say, you can be saved. I'm here to tell you 
that the worst of the worst, the Assyrians, called upon the name of the Lord, and what did he do? He did not have them perish. He calls them now his own. If you come, come with me uh, 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 to uh, Acts, uh, Acts 10, um, if I can get there. Acts 10.34, it says, um, Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. He does not say that I'm only going to save this people. It is to all the nations. To all the nations. He goes on in, in, in Romans uh, in, in Romans um, uh, 10, 14, and 15, and he says this. He says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good tidings. This is our command. This is what we're supposed to do. This is not about something that we think we should, could, or not do. We have been called to do it, whether it is in this house here this morning, because there is one person that does not have a personal relationship with Christ, or it is your next door neighbor, or the ends of the earth, but we are called to preach the good news. The day that you asked Christ into your life, you were a minister the gospel. Isaiah said it most poignantly, I think, in Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And he answers and he says, here am I, send me. Send me. So Jonah is in this place he doesn't want to go, preaching to a people that he can't stand, that have destroyed his people, that have done all these horrible things, and, and God's hand of grace is upon every single one of them. We got to go. We have no choice. We got to go. But like most people I know, Jonah ran, why? Because he didn't want them to be saved. They weren't good enough in his mind to be saved. So chapter 4 takes a moment to say, hey, I'm not a happy buckaroo over this whole thing. And, and he, says, he says, but it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And you go down in verse 2, and he says, For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. He, he knew what God was going to do. And that's why he was so upset. It's no different than the man who you sit and have a conversation with who says, A murderer has no right. Adolf Hitler has no right. But the fact of the matter is, it's not our decision. It is the Lord God's decision who is in and who is not in. And his word tells us that when you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. Amen. Romans, Romans 5.8 says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us knowing that we were sinners. And Jonah, Jonah goes and he sulks. Just, he sulks, you know. I don't care, I don't like them. And he goes off into the east, you know, outside the city. And he says in verse 5, Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. Uh, there he made a shelter for himself and sat under in the shade until he could see what would happen. In the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah. So 
Now, I stop right there for a second because I'm sitting here thinking, Jonah is doing nothing but basically battling out with God. You know, of all the people really who was not being obedient at this point, Jonah is the one who's not being obedient. But what does God do? He says, listen, I know you're hot. I'm going to go ahead and build this thing overnight. I'm going to give you shade. I want you to be comfortable. But then he shows him and teaches him a lesson. It's this, this whole idea. He says, as quickly as I give it, I can take it away. And he has this worm, and this worm goes out there and just eats that thing, and then he brings this scorching sun upon him. And, and you know, to the point where Jonah is crying out for death. It would be better to die than to be alive amidst this craziness that's going on. And, and the book basically ends with, with Jonah not happy, not a happy buckaroo. This is a lesson to show Jonah that it was right to have mercy on Nineveh. It was right to have mercy on Nineveh. I don't like everybody I come in contact with. I have a friend from my, from my office here this morning. He knows what goes on in the place that I work at. He knows. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but that is not what God has called us to do. God has called us to be forgiven. Why? Because he first forgave us. Why do we love? Because he first loved us. This is the gospel. This is what people see every day in us, in our homes, with our families. It is not enough to talk the talk. You have got to walk the walk. So I think Jonah, Jonah went off not a real happy buckaroo. But I want to conclude by saying this with you this morning. We all go through times when we don't want to obey. Mr. Sugahara chose to obey God and not man. And we've got to think about that. We've got to think about that every day. We've got to think about it on a regular basis. Who am I going to obey? If God calls me to do something, I've got to do it. If we don't go to Nineveh, we are disobeying God's command to go. I have this book of illustrations, and it was just ironic that I came across this. It's Missions, of a Lunatic, uh, missions, a Lunatic Project, question mark, right? So it says here, it says that the British uh, East India Company said at the beginning of the 19th century, the sending of Christian ministries into our eastern possessions is the maddest, most expensive, most unwarranted project that was ever proposed by a lunatic enthusiast. And he says, then the English lieutenant governor of Bengal said at the close of the 19th century, in my judgment, Christian missionaries have done more lasting good to the people of India than all other agencies combined. Your behavior is a reflection of what you truly believe. A gentleman by the name of Hiram W. Smith said that. Listen, we need to repent. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. That's who we are to him. To have this intimate, wonderful experience with him. Make it personal. You, you don't have to ask Brother Joe to pray for you. Pray and talk to him directly. He wants to hear from you. So I want to I wanna pray this morning. And um, there are going to be some guys down here. Um, but I want every head to bow, every eye closed. And I want to say to you this morning that if you have never asked Jesus into your life, 2 Corinthians 6.2 tells us that today is the day of salvation.